Uh, do, you, do you have any opinions or uh, issue-oriented uh, ideas on like smart energy, green energy, any, any things like that? Well, I think absolutely, and, and whether or not you, you know you believe in, in global warming, uh, which I think that we need to be very concerned with, we we absolutely need to be concerned about reducing our dependence on foreign oil. And that's that's definitely and, true. And you know, we had an opportunity in the late 1970s. I remember I had just gotten my driver's license, waiting in long lines, gas lines during the Carter administration. Do you think the Congress at that point would have said, "Okay, we got to do something about our dependence on foreign oil," and we didn't. We let that opportunity slide. We're at a point in our history now where I believe we really can change the way we power this country. I believe the uh, renewable energy initiatives can be bigger than the internet was just a decade ago. Uh, so I'm very excited about the possibilities that we have, particularly here in Colorado and in northern and eastern Colorado, where we have unparalleled resources for solar and wind, uh, potential for uh, biodiesel. So we need to embrace those. I think the government has a role in making sure that we provide incentives for these technologies to really grow um, and prosper and, and can really do, can make a difference in, in reducing, dramatically reducing our dependence on foreign oil. And that's absolutely the way we have to go so we don't have to go into a rock again. And we don't need our policies written or driven by some kind of issue like that. We should, we, you know, I'm not advocating for isolationism, but we should never engage in war because we weren't thinking for, uh, forthrightly enough about our needs to fuel our economy. Right. And you know, there's also the, the whole green energy industry is good for economic development in northern Colorado. And northern Colorado wants to become the leader in renewable energy and is actively courting clean industries. Um, the Eastern Plains, it's great for the economies in places like Logan County. They have two large wind farms um, and it needs a lot of revenue for both the county government and also for those individual farmers who you know, maybe their wells have been shut off. Um, and, and they can now put up a turbine on their property and some of them are getting upwards of $1,000 a year per turbine on their property just for having it there. And they can still graze cattle, so it's, it's just a win for everyone. And as we all know, there's plenty of wind in northeastern Colorado. Actually, <laughs> just about all of northern Colorado is plenty of wind. So um, I'm glad to see that uh, you are wanting to take us in that direction, and that, that's very optimistic for our economy and our, our future, our country, and our world. Yes. And we also have a governor whose inauguration speech included quite a lot of talk about making Colorado a leader in renewable and uh, uh, biodiesel and, and energies of that sort, green energy. So fortunately, we have a, a governor in office, Bill Ritter, who's thinking ahead. And it sounds like in northeastern Colorado, we're going to have a green leader as well, which is a pro-environment and pro-jobs, so that's good to hear. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and this is UP News, UltimatePolitics.net, on 1510 AM, Mile High Sports Radio, and we're here with Betsy Markey, and we'll be right back. Thanks a lot. And we're back here on UP News, uh, on 1510 AM, Mile High Sports Radio. You can tune in to us Saturday mornings at 7 AM on 1510 in the Denver area and 1570 up in northern Colorado. And we're here with candidate for CD4, Betsy Markey. We were talking about green environmental energy, and uh, we're going to pick back up with that. Betsy, you mentioned something else about green, uh, green investments, green building. Talk a little bit more about that. That sounded really interesting. Right. Well, you know, from what I understand, over 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from our buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, a quarter, probably a quarter from our vehicles, industry, agriculture is a very, very small part. But for the most part, the bulk of it is from our buildings. And so what can we do to incentivize builders to build uh, buildings to lead standards using green building technologies? And I think there's a lot of exciting possibilities. There's a school um, in the district, Ray High School, which got a grant from the federal government in order to become wind powered. And now that school will soon be 100% powered by wind in Ray, Colorado. It's right by the Nebraska border. Out, and they, out past brush, right? Out, yes. Yeah, a couple hours past brush. And uh, 
they're going to be producing, they expect to be producing so much wind that they're going to be able to put excess energy on the grid and also power part of Ray, uh, the town of Ray as well. So I think that's, you know, that's an exciting uh, possibility. Just in Fort Collins, the Poudre School District has made a commitment to build all of their new schools to lead standards. Uh, Fossil Ridge High School was built just a couple of years ago, and their first year in operation, they saved $100,000 in utility bills over Fort Collins High School. Roughly the same size, that's two and a half teachers. So I think just building green saves us money and protects the environment, and we can do it. But again, we have to, if, if we're talking about homes or commercial buildings, we need to figure out a way to provide those incentives for the builders who may, may not be living in, in that building or in, in that house in order to do the right thing and build with you know, geothermal, solar panels as a matter of course, uh, wind power. And, and we've got the technology to do that. We just have to uh, really have to provide the incentives so that it can be done. And that can make a huge difference in global warming. Do you think your district could be a, a leader in the state for green energy and renewable energy? I think so. I think there's a lot of exciting things going on, for instance, at Colorado State University. Uh, with regard to uh, different spin-off companies that have come about through research done at CSU. Another one is, uh, you might be familiar with ABA Solar, which is technology to take ordinary window pane and uh, turn it into solar panels. I think this has got great opportunities because they're talking about a cost of maybe one-seventh to one-tenth of what solar panels cost right now. So if we can get the cost down on these technologies, uh, it, then it, it should be a matter of course that we install them. In new and existing buildings. And we need legislators and House of Representatives, state senators, uh, all the way up to the president to lead, as, as you're talking, in making it easier for, for policies to be enacted so that people aren't having to hunt out opportunities like that, but it's actually the government leading in that direction. And that's exactly right. That's what we are all looking for are people who will be leaders and to push these technologies that we know are going to be good for the future, people who are visionaries and can see the potential good uh, both for economic development, reducing our dependence on foreign oil, and protecting our planet for our children and grandchildren. All right. Uh, I'm glad to hear someone that is thinking about the future that has a, a background uh, with small business who is thinking about how to make the country economically stronger and not wasting time debating and supporting the Defensive Marriage Act and other bills that do nothing but stir up needless debate. Oh, we're so beyond that, aren't we? You know, I we know so. that that is not the role of government in these far-right social issues. People are ready for their elected leaders to go to Washington, you know, to go to the state capitol, roll up their sleeves, and just start to work work with Republicans, with Democrats, you know, in, in the case of Congress, work with the executive branch, work with the legislative branch to just get some things done, to start making progress on the problems that we all care about. I know uh, after working with young people as a therapist, a lot of kids coming out of high school um, or in high school and going into college are worried about a couple things you might, you might have been aware of. First of all is, Am I going to get a good enough education? Is my school going to be good? And the, the trend has been to kind of go at a underfunded, no child left behind, and then you know hopefully the kid will do well at, in that situation. And then if they do go on to college, which they should, they're faced with enormous financial obstacles. Um, what are some of the plans or ideas you have to make school more affordable or, or more functioning for our young kids in your district? And, for opportunities beyond high school. Right. You know, I've met with students at CU, at CSU, at UNC, in Greeley, and, <laughs> you know, one thing that I hear is uh, the difficulty in getting grant money. You know, the Pell Grant was started 20, 30 years ago, and it's much more difficult to get that now, so we should strengthen our grant programs for kids. And also, we absolutely have to uh, continue to lower the interest rates on federally subsidized student loans. Mm -hmm. That's how our generation got through college on very, very low-cost student loans. Um, and so we need to make college more affordable in that way. I, I do want to say, though, that not, you know, in terms of, of uh, 
uh, K through 12, I also believe we need to, to take a look at strengthening our vocational education programs as well because not every kid is going to go to college and nor should they, but there's a lot of opportunities in the trades to train uh, students when they're in high school, whether it's in auto mechanics, uh, lots of different things, radiology. Hopefully there's, wind turbine construction. <laughs> there we go, carpentry, um, and, and that we should be promoting these as, as well.